Welcome back to The Big Show. It's Alex Belfield in the morning talking to the star of a new British film. It's called The King's Speech and it's released this week and tells the story of George VI's battle to overcome a terrible stammer. Michael Palin, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. Very well indeed. Hey, listen, thank you for talking to me. One, Pleasure. because you're a genius and two, because you're a legend and <laughs> C, because you must have better people to talk to than me, Michael. <laughs> Nobody better. Nobody better. I have, <laughs> I've gone trawled the world of great celebrities. I am that desperate. How's your life going? I just John Cleese on last week and he's out doing the business again and you're in such a great place now because you can pick and choose can't you? Um, well I've always been able to really, it's been one of the great joys of, of a freelance life I've managed to uh, do things that I wanted to do and in which I had some sort of control and some sort of kind of connection and things that I've enjoyed I've done, I've, I've done very few things which I haven't enjoyed, uh, either for the money or because someone told me to do them. So I've been, I've been very, very lucky, actually, to, to pick and choose. And most of the decisions I've made have been, you know, you know been my own and, 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 and have been reasonably what I wanted to do. Have you reached that point yet where, in your own mind, you've got nothing to prove and you've made it, and if you just leave us with your legacy that's already out there, that's enough? Or are you still fighting for something? Oh, I don't. I never think in terms of legacy or really what you leave behind. It's very much you know, take each day as it comes. I want to make sure that I keep producing material because just to keep my brain and body going, you know. And I've as much of an appetite for life and the world, and and I'm as curious about things as I ever was. Um, it's just a question of making sure that you continue to do good work. Uh, and um, throughout my life, throughout my working life, I've sort of been very, very lucky to work with people who set a very high standard. And I want to make sure I keep up that standard and don't just sort of gradually fade and do things that are, are rather dull. Um, so that's, that, that's really what I'm concerned about. When we look at your history, you've had such a, a blessed career in one way, but you put the groundwork in, didn't you? I mean, you're always funny and trying to be funny. Well, I was lucky in that I, I could always make people laugh at school and things like that, but I never expected I would ever um, make that into a career. Um, and indeed, my parents would have been you know, very anxious that I didn't make that into a career. But the people who were my heroes when I was young were not actually comedy performers so much as writers, people like... Uh, Simpson and Galton, who wrote uh, Hancock and um, uh, and Steptoe and Son and Spike Milligan, you know, I just thought these are great. I'd love to be able to write that sort of stuff. And I very fortunately, after university, hanging around, I took up uh, a writing partnership with Terry Jones, and um, we were very lucky to end up writing for the first Frost Report, and then for a kids series called Do Not Adjust Your Set, and that led on to Monty Python after four or five years. Um, I think it was just that I, I, I knew I could do that, but I wasn't quite sure how you got into it. It's not like you don't do an apprenticeship in, in writing comedy. It's just something you feel and you, uh, if it's right, you carry on, even though it doesn't pay very much to start with, which it really didn't. <laughs> I said to John Cleese a few weeks ago when I had him on the programme, do you think that Monty would be made today if it were put forward? Because it's so silly, throwing a cow over a wall isn't exactly genius, is it? But it worked in that time. What did he say? He said no, <laughs> it wouldn't yeah, be made. I'd agree, with him. I'd agree with him. I think we'd have to explain it far too much. And I think the BBC has uh, sort of plans things more carefully and vets things more carefully. There was a kind of cavalier time at the end of the 60s, not just at, in television, but you know, and music and fashion and all that, where people were expected to produce something new. And, you know, it was not no great sort of deal for the BBC to offer a bunch of people uh, 13 programmes to do something they didn't quite understand um, in a basement, in, in a basement studio, in TV centre. But that's what we did. Was it as funny and sexy as it appeared to us on the outside? You seem to have a lot of fun. Um, yeah, we did have a lot of fun. Um yeah, it was great. I mean, it was sort of, you, 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 it was probably equivalent of sort of sitting around in the pub and telling each other jokes um, and yet getting paid for it. Um, we all, you know, were a comedy show and we all made each other laugh a lot. And it was rather exciting discovering that there was a kind of chemistry as far as the humor went amongst us all. Um, and it wasn't, um, you know, you don't necessarily expect that six people will be able to produce a show. It seems a rather cumbersome number. But for some strange reason, the six of us really made each other laugh and the comedy was complimentary. Everyone added a bit to it. I mean, we had completely different ways of life apart from that. But when it came to sitting around a table and, and writing comedy, 
um, it was it was really uh, a wonderful sort of um, you know powerful sort of unit, and with Terry Gilliam doing the animation as well, that was a, 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 a something that no one else had at the time. We 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 did so we did enjoy it. Yeah, it was very exciting. Yeah. You've worked with so many. Who's impressed you the most in terms of comic timing? Well, I think that um, I, w- I would say uh, John is John Cleese is superb uh, to work with. Um, I just I've done many sketches with him, and, and it, it's it's like a finely tuned piece of some music, getting the right moment and the right pause. And I've worked with Maggie Smith, who's incomparable. Um, but you know, there are a lot of uh, a lot of people who understand comedy, whether it's Tim Spall or whoever. You know that 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 you just know that they they know how to play it, um, and more importantly, you know, good people to write it. I mean, I'm very lucky to have had scripts from um, you know done films with John Cleese script with um, Alan Bennett script, both brilliant. Um, Alan Bleasdale too. You know, not always comedy, but. Uh, there's something very good about the way he constructs a script and if you do it well you've got the timing right yeah are you only as good as your writing can you bring rubbish to life because you're a great actor or comedian or is it all in the writing i think it's basically in the writing to start with which is why python was so strong because we wrote and we performed our own material um if something doesn't work on the page i think you're going to struggle to make it work in performance um you know it's as simple as that uh, so I do think writing, uh, I do think writing, getting it right first is, is is very very important. Most recently, we know you for travelling. That's been a big part of your life, and I wish I could be just you for a few minutes because you've seen so many wonderful things. And I think a person who's travelled is so much more interesting than someone who's lived in the same place and never gone anywhere because it teaches you so much about other people and cultures. Do you see how blessed and lucky you were to get those gigs? Uh, yes, I, I am. I uh, eternally sort of thank. The fate that I uh, I took up that job um, on around the world in eighty days after about four or five other people had turned it down, um, but I think it was uh, I, I I realize now that I'd always wanted to travel, and it, in a sense it's also about meeting people which I've always quite enjoyed, um, and and that was what made it work, and I think we we created a way of traveling which was more a series of encounters rather than some expert telling you about the world and and that's the way i've i've always you know i've, I've always done it and that's what i enjoy about those 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 journeys but um it was just um very very uh surprising and very gratifying that this rather rough and ready form of traveling that we you know got me through around the world in 80 days a camera following me everywhere even where i'm making terrible mistakes and goofs and getting ill and all that sort of thing worked uh, no one had really done that because you don't create something like that you don't say let's send someone around the world to get ill and, and forget his lines and and, um, and and get the language wrong uh, <laughs> Have you ever considered that you created reality TV? Because when I think of the Bush Tucker trial or whatever they do on that dreadful I'm a celebrity, I mean, you were doing it 30 years ago, weren't you? Well, for real, yeah. <laughs> no one had to create it. I mean, just eating the local food. But I think throwing yourself into the local culture is, is quite important, yeah. What did you learn? What was the most interesting place you visited? Who was the most interesting person you met on your journey? I always think Peru was a pretty amazing place. The reason why I say it is because um, it was a combination of, 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 of absolutely stunning scenery, um, the Andes and then the, the high plain with Cuzco and Machu Picchu, but also because it was uh, 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 the furthest I've got off the beaten track. We went beyond Machu Picchu, which most people don't do, onto the headwaters of the Amazon, down some white water. Uh, rapids and into a wonderful canyon called the Pongo de Manaik, <laughs> and it was just <laughs> the most beautiful place. The the rock was was shining black. The water was pouring out of the forest, um, and there were these huge, great black butterflies. I remember that, and I thought, now this is getting away from it all. This is really the essence of why I travel. Uh, but you have, to have, you have to have Heathrow Airport at the same time, so you don't get all the best. You must be very relieved you don't have to travel today with all those scanners and security. It'd take forever, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, it is more difficult now, oddly enough. I mean, although you can fly around the world, you, 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 um, you're, you're 
many more restrictions, but it's still a great, and I'm still terribly tempted to travel. I, I look at atmospheres, I look at maps, I'm a guy, I'm a sort of sucker for uh, glossy photos of, uh, of remote parts of the world. <laughs> and of course, everybody knows you for your travelling, everybody knows you, of course, for the comedy, but what people might not know is you've got the Michael Palin Centre for Stammering Children, yeah. which was opened in 1993. Why did you want to do that? Because my father had a very severe stammer, um, and uh, it was with him all the time. I knew him, and there seemed to be no um, information on why the stammer had, had um, where it had begun. All I knew about it was that it obviously affected his life um, quite seriously. It uh, meant he couldn't just get up and talk around the table as other his other sort of business colleagues could without a lot of pressure. Couldn't even tell jokes, really, without sort of thinking about it very carefully. And and so, you know, he never knew when he would be fluent or not fluent, and I think it made him very frustrated. And, and um, after I made <laughs> A Fish Call Wonder, in which I played a stammerer, uh, various people got in touch with me, and uh, two of them were, were had a new therapy for... for um, uh, dealing with stammering in childhood. And I thought, well, this is very interesting. And they said, that's the time. If you can get a, uh, a child um, with a stammer when they're quite young, before the stammer has become absolutely established, then you can manage that stammer. You can't cure it, but you can actually improve things so much that their lives won't be blighted in the way that my father's life was blighted and that they'll be able to just, uh, like any other uh, fluent people, be able to sort of, um, uh, take life and, and take life's chances ahead of them. So that was why I, I said, all right, I'll, I'll get involved. It must be very difficult because it's one of those socially awkward things, isn't it, that kind of is self-fulfilling. You get nervous, then you stammer, and you don't want to stammer, so you stammer even more because you're thinking about it. It must be very difficult to get out of that circle. Yes, I think it, that's absolutely it. A lot of it is to do with pressure, which is what the, the film The King's Speech is all about. You know, here's the, the monarch. You'd think, well, he's all right. He's top of the pile. But it's just as bad, if not worse, for him because he has to sort of verbalize what the nation should be thinking at any one time. Um, and it is all about pressure. And my father was much more relaxed at home. His stammer would be less pronounced. Um, but if he was with people he just met or if there's something he... You know, the, the irony is if there's something you really want to say and it's really important to you, that's when the block might might come. But um, uh, it's it's most interesting the way um, the, the, the therapy works with the children. They get children together in a group and all these children who stammer finding out about each other and why they all stammer. Hmm. I think the problem with my dad was that, that we didn't talk about it. We all sort of it was brushed under the carpet because nothing we could do, therefore don't... Don't make it worse by sort of um, bringing the subject up. And I think the great thing about the Stammering Centre and the wonderful work they do there is, is that um, they confront the problem and they don't pretend it's not there. And they try and understand why it exists. And, and a lot of children are very much helped by that. And what I can see from the website is there's hope. There's someone there who can listen and help. And there is a way forward, isn't there? Yes. The, yes, definitely. And and. You know, the more the merrier. Uh, uh, we we have our our centre of excellence in London, and we're hoping that it will be expanded because I think there need to be more places like this around the country. Mm. Um, and I, I mean, I have I do know that the Leeds Bradford NHS people are, um, and the Stammering Charity are, are discussing a possible North of England uh, centre, which will be terrific. Well, if you manage to get that going, do come on again. This has been we a great honour and a pleasure for me. Thank you so much for your time, Michael Palin. Google the uh, Michael Palin Centre for Stammering Children. Find out more there. The new film, British film as well, The King's Speech, is released this week and it's out now and uh, getting tremendous reviews as well. And Michael Palin, thank you so much for your time. Great honour and good okay. luck with everything. A pleasure. Thank you, Alex.